Hello and welcome to Science with Mrs. Blackburn. Today we're going to be talking about the nature of science and what I mean by that is what science really is and how we do it. So when you hear the word science, a few things might come to mind. You might think of a person in a lab coat with a bunch of different beakers full of liquids, mixing them together. You might think of explosions. Um, you might even think about uh, space exploration. Um, but when we talk about science, we're really talking about a process and the knowledge that we get from that process. So what is science? If we actually look at the textbook definition of science, we get something like this. The investigation of natural events and the information gathered from that investigation. <clears throat> so like I said before, we have two important things. We have an investigation, looking into something, that could be an experiment, and then the information that we gather from that. So science is kind of twofold. It's about a process, and it's about the knowledge gained from that process. So for what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna focus more on the process of science, how we do science to get the knowledge that we need. So this process is called a couple of different things that you might be familiar with. Sometimes it's called scientific inquiry, and most of the time it's called the scientific method. So when we talk about scientific method, we are talking about the process that is done to gain new information. So you might have seen in textbooks or on posters in science teachers rooms, some different versions of the scientific method. And they all look different, but they're all saying the same Thing. They might have different numbers of steps and they might show different uh, graphic representations of those steps, but they really mean the same type of process. In fact, there's no one true scientific method step per step that everybody goes by. <clears throat> they go by basically different versions of the same idea and we're going to talk about that idea today. So the first main step in any scientific method is going to be to notice something, to ask some sort of question about something that you notice. That's why really curious people make good scientists, because they notice things that they want to investigate. The next step would be to make a hypothesis. You might have heard of a hypothesis described as an educated guess. A hypothesis is actually more than that. It's something that we can um, assume. It is an inference that we can make, but it's one that absolutely can be tested. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. Then you're going to do something to test your hypothesis. You're going to design and do an experiment that allows you to see if your hypothesis was correct. After you're done with the experiment, you will analyze your test results, which means you're gonna look at them and see uh, what your data told you. By the way, data is the information you're gonna gather when you test your hypothesis. You're gonna draw conclusions from those test results. You're gonna really dig into that information and see if it means anything at all. And finally, you're gonna communicate your results. We're really happy that scientists do that because they don't keep their new information to themselves. They share it with the world in a lot of different ways. And because of that, we have things like medicine and technology to support. So what I've done here is I am showing you how each step can be reworded or phrased in a different way, but still basically be the same step. So here, I have, instead of asking a question, making an observation. That's the first step. A scientist is just going to notice something that's going to make her curious and want to delve into that. So that could be in the form of a question or observation. Then your hypothesis is where you just state what you think is going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? And it needs to be testable, something that you know that you can test. Then you can design and perform the experiment. In the last slide, it said test hypothesis. That means the same thing. In the last slide, it talked about analyzing results. That's where you just look for patterns and meaning. And then drawing conclusions, I have changed to deciding what your data tells you, okay? So all of these things mean the same things, they're just worded differently. So I wanted to show you this because a lot of times students get confused because they see all these different versions of the scientific method and think it means something different, but it doesn't. It's just worded different. And then finally, for communicating your results, I put down here, just tell everyone about it. That's what we mean by communicating your results. 
Now, one little side note that I wanted to add. <clears throat> there is another step that sometimes gets left out of the scientific method or rolled into um, the hypothesis section or the making observation section. And that is right here. It's usually right in between those two or within them. And that step is to do background research. Now, a good scientist, before they just start doing an experiment and planning for something, will go around and try to figure out about the topic they are going to do an experiment about. They're going to do background research, see if there have been other studies on that topic. They're going to make sure that they know all about that topic that they can and gather any information that's going to help them design an effective experiment. So let's say that you are trying to draw conclusions from your data that you gathered during your experiment and you realize that your hypothesis was not supported. What do you do now? Do you just stop and say, okay, I was wrong, I'm done, and throw everything away? No, that's not how science works. You actually have some observations that you made while looking at that data that will allow you to go right back to the first step of the scientific method and start all over again. <clears throat> so this process can take a variety of different paths and it really helps people really delve into a topic and try to research it and, and figure out what's really happening. When we find out that our initial hypothesis was not supported, we don't just quit, we go back and do the process again. And then we tell everyone about it. So you might be asking yourself, what does this look like in real life? How do I know what step is a hypothesis and what does a real experiment look like? Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a little situation and a little example so we can look at this together. So I'm going to use my handy dandy lab partner today, Scraggle. So this is my cat, his name is Scraggle. He is about five years old and he has a bad hair day every day. That's why his name is Scraggle. And also something that you might notice about him in this picture is that he does have a little bit of a weight problem. So. That is actually something that is an observation that we have just made. He's a little chunky, right? So that might lead us to ask a question. What type of food would help my cat lose weight? So as you can see, we're jumping right into the scientific method. My observation was that my cat's a little chunky and my question is what type of food could help him lose weight? So one thing that I might want to do here that would be helpful, as I mentioned earlier, would be to do some background research before I do any sort of experiment. I might want to find information about feline metabolism. I might want to talk to a vet. I might want to research some different types of foods that are out there to help cats lose weight. So that would be the first thing I would need to do. That would give me some good information on cat weight loss. From there, from that research, I might want to come up with a hypothesis. Now, this is the word that most science students in middle school have heard before, and they all define it as an educated guess. Well, you are right in a way, a hypothesis is an educated guess, um, but it is something that will be testable, okay? So in this experiment, in this scientific method uh, example, I might give a hypothesis, something like, if I give my cat the cat food brand B, then he will lose weight. So let's say I pick a few different cat foods that I'm gonna test out on him, and I think based on my background research that cat food brand B is gonna be the one that will help him lose weight. That is a good hypothesis. Now, something I want you to notice about how this hypothesis is worded. <clears throat> this is how you know if something is a testable hypothesis. It's not a hypothesis if you can't test it. That's what makes a hypothesis different from an inference, okay, or an assumption. So, see that word if? If I give my cat food brand B, my cat to the cat food brand B, then he will lose weight, okay? Those two words help us realize that it is testable, okay? Because it says, if I do this thing, then this will happen. That is my hypothesis. So that's what I think will happen once I do my test. So from there, 
The next step would be to design and perform the experiment. Now, there are some things that need to go into an experiment that are very important. And that's something that we will talk about in future videos coming up and in class coming up. So don't worry too much about the design just yet, but know that it has to be designed in a specific way. But here's where you will also perform your experiment after you've designed it. So you are gonna take measurements, you're going to collect data, make observations about the cat food, all of those things that we talked about earlier. Once you have done that with your handy dandy lab partner here, so let's say I gave him um, each different brand of food for however many weeks and I tracked his weight during the whole time and took average weights. There are plenty of ways I could do this experiment, but once I've done it, I'm going to have some data. I'm going to have some information that I noticed as I did the experiment and I'm gonna record that data. I'm not just gonna look at him and say, ah, he looks skinnier today. I'm gonna to write down his weight. I'm gonna take averages, I'm gonna do measurements, things like that, and I'm gonna record that data. So this is the data and observations phase of the scientific method, okay? Now, it's not enough to just collect that data Data is information that tells me something. Data is information that I need to really look at to see if my hypothesis is supported or not. So let's say that this is a graph from my experiment that I've done. And let's say that I look at this and very obviously he weighed the very least when he was on which cat food? Cat food A. So, Something I might notice when I analyze those results is that my cat weighed less on average while eating cat food A. That is information that I can get from that data. Now, is that enough? Not quite yet. That's just something that I noticed, okay? What do I do next? I will need to draw conclusions from that data, okay? The conclusion I can make from the fact that he weighed the least when he was eating that cat food was that there's evidence that cat food A leads to weight loss in cats. That is the conclusion I might want to draw from that experiment. Now, here's my disclaimer. It's a little bit more complicated than that, and when we talk about experimental design, you're gonna see some flaws in my experiment later. But right now, we're really just talking about the scientific process. So, last step of the scientific method is to communicate your results. You don't wanna keep information to yourself when you come up with some sort of scientific breakthrough. We need to share as much information as possible with others. So this could be done in a variety of ways. For you, it might be something like presenting at a science fair, okay? Or presenting to a group of people with similar interests. Um, in real life, it can be press releases. It can be uh, news stories. Um, where you see that scientists come up with certain breakthroughs. But the most important way that scientists will communicate their results are in peer-reviewed journals, scientific journals. Now, here's what those are. The peer review process is where experts in a certain field make sure that the study and the experiment was done correctly and can be repeated. This is how we know that scientists aren't just out there making up their own data. Their experiments need to be able to be repeated. Basically, they will release their study in a journal and any scientist around the world can redo that experiment and see if they get similar results. This keeps everybody above board. This keeps it um, more ethical and this lets us as society be able to trust scientific information because it's not just like one scientist comes out and makes up all this information. Others have to look at it for it to go into a peer-reviewed journal. For that reason, you know you are getting the best information if you are reading science from a peer-reviewed scientific journal because it has gone through the ringer. Lots of people have looked at it and it won't make it into that journal unless the process is repeatable and the scientist has done this the right way. So peer-reviewed scientific journals are the best way that scientists in real life communicate their results. So they get the gold badge for being the highest uh, quality place that a scientist wants to communicate her results. So 
that is a um, review of the scientific process. Hopefully we uh, realize some different things about that process and realize what science really is like. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel to learn more. Thank you and have a wonderful day.